Hello and welcome to episode 29-ish of Runners Only with Dom Harvey. On this episode, triathlete Hayden Wild. Yeah, that was, uh, that was definitely for my, um, uh, that was for my family and um, yeah, for my dad as well. He passed away like 12 years ago, so he never got to see me race. So. Now I need to put a disclaimer out there. This is a repeat episode that was first shared back in March. I'm reposting it because at the time of recording, Hayden was in Birmingham for the 2022 Commonwealth Games. If you've already heard it, feel free to listen again. It's a great chat, or you can skip it. Or if you've not heard it, I really hope you enjoy it. We discuss a whole lot of stuff. How he won and then almost lost his Olympic medal. Losing his dad in a plane crash as a young boy. The romantic gesture to his girlfriend while she was in MIQ and much, much more. All right, let's get into it. Hey, runners only, yeah, yeah, let's get it started. Hey, hey, this is runners only with Dom Harvey. Uh, fast paced, slow and steady, any way you coming. Uh, just want to connect for everyone who loves running. This is runners only, yeah, yeah let's get it started. Hey, hey, this is runners only with Dom Harvey. Uh, fast paced, slow and steady, any way you coming. Uh, just want to connect for everyone who loves running. Hey, runners only with Dom Harvey. Runners Only with Dom Harvey and Hayden Wild, Olympic Games bronze medalist in the triathlon. G'day, mate. Oh, how's it going? It's good to good to meet you in real life. Yeah, I've I've always heard you at five a.m. when I go to some squads, so it's actually Mm. nice to put a face to the name. Have we have we met before? I know we were in this. We we were running an event on the same day. You did a half marathon, and I was doing a marathon in Hawke's Bay. Did we meet then or no? I don't think we did because I think you know it starts about halfway. So you started obviously probably uh, in the city. Um, but I do recall, yeah, you doing uh, you you had a yarn about it uh, post post run, and uh, yeah, I finished up um, as well. Um, but it was very nice, kind of finishing in the vineyard. It was actually like one of the best kind of post events I've ever had. Have big, gonna in the vineyard, have yeah. a wine or two, uh, yeah. good little uh, good little setup. And you you won that day. How old were you at the time? Uh, I was about sixteen, seventeen. Um, I just moved. Uh, I did, well, I just moved. Did my last year in high school, um, and then kind of moved to Tauranga from Fakatana, and actually bet my coach um, that I actually uh, presently have Craig Kirkwood, who's uh, well accomplished in the marathon at the moment. Um, but yeah, he's uh, it was quite funny. So that's kind of how the banter started. And I think every time he gets he's on a podcast, that gets brought up. And uh, kind of he was going down there. He was all uh, pre- pretty confident that he was going to take a thousand bucks home. But then some kid from Fakatane just kind of <laughs> stole his lunch. So and then then how did the relationship start? Like did he did he hit you up and offer to coach you? Or um, Craig's one of those guys that doesn't like to approach anyone. It's kind of you approach him. Um, you know he doesn't like that po- um, poaching or doing anything like that. It's like he sees their talent and you know might give some tips in here and there and then the um, it might start but I actually had a guy called Dave Jags who was my coach uh, did multi spots of the coast to coast and whatnot uh, and then from there my Dave pretty much turned around and said like um, like mate I'm probably pretty much at my peak of coaching uh, I could, don't know if I can coach you any longer which was like pretty awesome to hear so he gave me a couple options in Tauranga and so he broke um, up with you yeah he pretty much did he was he broke up but on a good basis so. yeah basically saying basically saying you were you were you know you, you've sort of outgrown the pond. Yeah, pretty much, yeah, which was yeah. awesome. Like, there was no bad blood. I was still into his gym mm. every so often. We always give each other banter all the time. And uh, he's like, you know, I've got two coaches that are, I know that are well better than my capabilities. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I had two options. And my physio at the time was getting coached by a lady called Liz Van Whirley, who went to the Olympics and Com Games for swimming. And she... Well, her stepdaughter was getting coached by Craig, and that's kind of how it started. And Craig was also doing Ironman at the the present time, so that's uh, kind of how that linked in quite nicely. And uh, was, was part of you like, I don't want the guy to coach me. I, I, I'm better than him already. I know, <laughs> I right? Keep his ass. I know. I was like, <laughs> I was like, didn't know who the guy was. It was actually quite funny because they, uh, I forgot the pre, um, the commentator who was at the who was doing all the award ceremony and whatnot, and they were just blowing smoke right up his ass. It was quite funny. Uh, and then the yeah, couple months later, I, I was coached by him, and uh, you haven't looked back since. So um, he's got a pretty good. Uh, resume behind him now with you know coaching Sam Tanner who went to the um, Olympics mm, for the yeah. 15 as well and yeah. you know he's pretty much coached him from uh, complete scratch uh, obviously he had a massive um, natural talent and uh, a big kick but uh, you know you've got to nurture that and, and put that in the right direction so um, mm. yeah he also you know, coached me from ground zero I think I was like a, a 16 minute 5k guy and now I'm a 13 28 uh, off the bat so uh, it's uh it's yeah, massive improvements. Wow, that is huge. <laughs> yeah. That is huge. Yeah. Even 16 minutes is, 
Huge as well. Yeah, it was actually in the night of fives in, uh, in Auckland. Um, yeah, it was my kind of my first track, proper track race after uh, high school. Um, and uh, he was like, oh, I think you could probably run about 15.30. Um, so I went out and went out way too hard with the front group and just completely just blew my doors off. Um, and then suffered big time the last couple of K. I think I just came, I think I came last in that race. Uh, and then jog, jogged it in and I uh, just looked down I'm like, oh man, what the heck was that? And Craig, Craig laughed at me saying, oh, we've got a bit of work to do. <laughs> you, ca- you came last at 16 minutes. Shit. Yeah. God, yeah. I'd be, it's 12 and a half laps uh, to do, to do 5,000 metres. I, I can't tell you how many times I'd be lapped. <laughs> it's so embarrassing. Yeah, it was, it was, I think it was the A one. So I think I should have just gone with the B boys and, uh, and finished midfield. But it, when I was good experience and uh, it was definitely a, a rude awakening um, heading kind of into that professional yeah. tri-circuit. So mm. that was good. How much, how much of your, your talent is natural? Like, were you naturally good even, even before the, um, you know, the sharpening up with coaching and serious training? Well, I don't really, it's quite hard to know, actually, because I had, I did Strava when I was a, as a young fella. So, well, I only kind of started in high school. Uh, I only played football, uh, played a bit of uh, turf hockey. That was kind of my passion. Uh, played for Waikato Bays and um, a couple kind of international um, kind of um, Midland sort of um, teams uh, facing Aussie and uh, really enjoyed the hockey aspect um, and then kind of just got fit from there. I was actually pretty like chubby and whatnot through intermediate so there was no real natural talent. Uh, or like uh, fitness there back in the days. Uh, I used to get my ass kicked by my brothers. Um, but then, yeah, just kind of moved into the orienteering, six-hour bench races, 12-hour bench races, moved on to coast-to-coast to coast and had this massive engine but just compl- no speed at all. Mm. Um, and that's kind of when Craig came in and nurtured that speed and, you know, I had this big base that I could work with um, doing these massive, you know, days uh, on the feet. And then, yeah, all of a sudden, just like took a couple of years to to build this kind of the speed phase, and then all of a sudden it was real easy. And I think that's been uh, a blessing in disguise in a, in a way. Like just had this massive engine, and just had to kind of yeah work work on the speed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's been one of our biggest work ons. Um, but it's it's great that it had this, as I said, this big kind of um, this engine because it just the risk of injury was so low because mm. I had this big kind of um, yeah base and it was just really easy to work off, yeah. um, which was key. So you um yeah you you sort of down plat, but there must have been like a fair bit of natural talent if you're if you're winning half you know <laughs> open half marathon events as a as a school kid. Yeah, I think um, my first one was uh, actually uh, was at it was just after a hockey tournament and at at high school we. Uh, we played in uh, Auckland in the Auckland League uh, when we did our kind of high school um, kind of week um, camp, and um, I think just before it was uh, the Topo uh, Kinlock uh, race, and uh, I think I was probably year eleven. I don't know what maybe sixteen. It was my mm. birthday, um, and I did did the run on my birthday. And uh, it was kind of like an off-road one, which uh, it was pretty tough, but I still ran like, I was running probably like 115s, 113s as like a wow. a high school kid. So um, a guy that you might know, Mike Voss, uh, him and I used to battle each other. We're quite similar in age. We used to battle each other. Uh, and we we're like the only ones at our age that were kind of doing like half marathons and stuff. Um, so we, we both had these big engines, but just no speed. So it was quite funny. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where it started, just the longer stuff. And yeah. then I've kind of gone full circle and gone reverse and gone to this, you know, um, real short triathlon, 5,000 metre yeah. kind of work. By the way, can I just can I just say it's infuriating sitting here, um, and it's probably infuriating for some people listening to this podcast as well, <laughs> when you talk about having no speed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I, I understand what you're comparing no speed then to now, like yeah, you know, yeah. here you are at Olympic level and world class level, but shit, it's still quick. Yeah, I guess it's yeah. very quick. Like, and as as I touched on before, like I had a Strava when I was just coaching mm-hmm. myself and and doing it as like I still do it for the enjoyment, but more of like uh, not doing it as a job, uh, but more of just like a good old weekend warrior having a real good time with it. And um, yeah, I was looking back, and I was definitely one of those kids that kind of just went out for six k and just fully sent it, mm-hmm. uh, and then fully sending back then was like you know just run at three thirties until you blow, and that was, that's what it was like. Wow. I think, and I think that was kind of like the Bay of Plenty, like Fakatani culture. We had some awesome athletes getting produced, like Daniel Jones, uh, who won the Auckland Marathon just before. I used Wins to, everything. Yeah, oh, well, I used to run with the guy, and his brother uh, Brad was an amazing biker. Like um, back in the day. 
would would kind of tow Sam Gaze and Anton Cooper, mm. our, our Olympic mountain yeah, bikers, yeah. and uh, so we had such a great talent of athletes at my age. So getting pushed by those guys and just running with those guys. Yeah, do you find that helps having that sort of I don't know, competitive environment? You you're coached by Craig Kirkwood, and you've got Sam Tanner in the area as well. Do you find that ups your game, like training with people that are just as yeah, good or better than yourself? Yeah, I think so. Like I've always gone with a philosophy of training with like. Uh, pure athletes, so running with the runners, biking with the bikers, swimming with the swimmers uh, in that way. And I think Sam and I just thrive off each other so well because we know we trust our coach so well. We we don't do anything. Uh, we don't go over the over the kind of over the lip of um, sending it or going too hard. Mm. Uh, we do everything as controlled as we possibly can. We listen to our coach and it works well. Like I look back at the sessions I used to do when I was not coaching myself and I was like, man, I was an idiot back then. But you, cause you're just having fun and yeah. you just love running fast. But at the end of the day, most of your stuff shouldn't be fast. Like 90% of the time, um, most of our stuff is tempo running. Uh, we never really hit that much like threshold. Mm. Only when we come close to racing. So right, when you talk about tempo running, just for anyone that doesn't know what, what is yeah. That so tempo running for us is like something that you can hit um, quite comfortably. Um, so yes, it is fast. So for me, for example, I'm a say if I'm looking, at, I'm a ninety say a ninety minute half marathon athlete. Uh, a tempo for me, I should be hitting, you know, um, maybe like a 135. So it's comfortable, but, it, it, you know, you're feeling it. It's not your full max um, kind of session. So for me, we'd go on the track. We'd do instead of, um, you know, race pace for us would be 63, 400 laps. Um, wow. For our tempos, we'd be hitting 65, 66. Right. So it's about three, four seconds off race pace for us so that's to kind of give you an example of what our tempos would be oh my god that's crazy <laughs> that's unbelievable yeah, when we look at it now it's like I did I think at high school I've got uh, a couple of the like the 1500 meter uh, 800 meter records in our grass track I think it's like a 3 or like a 213 214 for the 800 and now we just kind of pop those out for um, 6 six by 800 meter um, efforts you know we're running at 208s 205s uh, we like. I look back now. I'm like, wow, I couldn't even do that three years, mm. five, you know, four, four years ago at high school, and now it's like just one of the reps that we do. It's crazy. Obviously, the quicker you get, it's harder to you know make more gains, and I suppose they become more marginal. But do you still think there's some um, room for growth and where you're at and where you want to be? Yeah, I think so. Like, um, you know, I've been in the sport for five years now and doing it properly for <laughs> five years now. So uh, I think there's definitely a lot more to gain. Uh, I think just the experience of being an athlete. Um, you know, I've I've had some amazing opportunities, but I'm still learning massively. Like. Okay, you got to listen to your body. Ninety, you know, oh, I think one hundred percent of the time, you got to listen to your body. Uh, if you're not feeling great, just tone it off a bit. Still do the session, but just take it a bit easier. And I think um, that's what um, it's so good being coached by Craig is like. It's Craig once told me, especially before the games, um, he was like, you know, we haven't done any breakthrough world record sessions, but we've made these amazing uh, blocks of. Uh, little sessions where they just you know stack on top of each other, and then uh, after after a while, all these um, you know blocks we've been building um, kind of make a perfect platform, and then mm. you kind of come into a race and you just you just feel good, and that's kind of what what we kind of uh, that's what our I guess philosophy is yeah. is just building the little sessions, and they just stack on top of each other and make this amazing kind of. Uh, athlete and and um, you know base coming into a into a race and yeah it works well for us. I got something I want to play here. Uh, we were we've been sitting in this um, podcast chat up for like the last month or so. <laughs> you were actually um, you sent me a voice memo while you were out training for <laughs> Xterra. Sweet man, sounds good. Yeah, apologies for that. Um, but yeah, safe travels. Have a good run. And uh, next time, if you're uh, if you're ever around, mate, hit us up for a run. Uh, it'd be pretty cool. Um, also, if you want to have a podcast as well, Malcolm Hicks, he'll be uh, around Auckland as well. So he's back in town, which is cool. Uh, we did a nice little 30k jolt uh, yesterday. Beautiful conditions. Oh, shit. Yeah, we'll see you soon. Sorry, mate. It's gone down a 
bit of a descent. Oh yeah, I think I was I was I was recording. I think I got to the end of the uphill part and I started like going on the flats a little bit downhill and I was like, oh, I better put the photo away. I'm going halfway down a uh, like a grade three trail. <laughs> so you, you you had just had one hand on the bar. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, you're yeah. a madman. <laughs> that was uh, I was like, well, it's a not, I finally got reception. I like. And once you get reception in the Redwoods, it uh, just starts, your phone starts pinging at you. So I just had a look and I was like, well, I've got another five minutes of climbing. I'll quickly do some admin. And it, as I was, because I was out for a four hour ride because yeah. I was training well for Xterra, but also for the uh, the Waka 100, which was unfortunately cancelled, which is a, it's a 100 kilometer mountain bike ride inside the Redwoods and just, you know, change of scenery, but a fun for me. Um, and uh, yeah, obviously couldn't do that, but um, yeah, I just love kind of cross training. Mm. It's 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 a fantastic kind of way to get mileage up. It's an interesting insight into into your day. What is an average day like in terms of training? It sounds like there was a lot going on. Yeah, so I'm I've, I'm actually as a I guess if I look at the international aspect of training as a professional, I'm not I don't probably train as much as others. Um, so I peak between. Um, 24 to 26 hours a week. Um, so that consists of about five kind of swims um, in the morning between 90 to two hours. Um, and then I normally go for, let's say, like a two run sessions uh, throughout the week um, with kind of a couple easier runs and a long run Sunday. So you're looking at five kind of runs a week. And then between that is, is cycling between an hour to about four hours of riding. So mm. that kind of yeah, adds up to Mostly about 24, 26 hours. If I look at other athletes on the circuit that I kind of race against, uh, and some most of the, some of the New Zealander athletes um, are between 28 to 32 hours. Yeah, right, right. So I guess my philosophy in training also is a little bit more intensity. So a lot of people say, for example, they go like uh, 80% of their stuff is endurance and just base mileage uh, with 20% of effort. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of that tempo threshold stuff. Uh, for me, it's kind of like a 40-60. Uh, so a little bit more intense, but just a little bit less kind of mileage as, as we like to call like junk yeah. mileage. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Do you find the swim training boring? Or are you yes. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, as much as like... Once you, I love open water swimming because it's just you know you're not looking at black line. But yeah, if I had to choose out of the three, that are uh, that is the the most tedious would be the swim. Like I guess if you are a, a swimmer uh, and swimming, you know, naturally feels easy. Like it is great when you when swimming feels easy. It's like when you get into the flow state of running. Just when running at, at a point gets like just feels great. It's it's great um, when you feel great in the right swim session. It feels great, but ninety percent of the time it just you're just grinding along trying mm. to hold on to the, the swimmers that I swim with um, and looking at the black line for a couple of hours. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty tough. Yeah, that's the, that's the funny thing about swim training because um, it seems like it's a real difficult sport to train for in terms of the hours involved. And you see like school kids going there at 5 a.m., 6 oh, a.m., mate, like, parents dropping them off. And you, you think, how many, how many of you guys are going to make it to the Olympics? Dude, it's, it's, you gotta, I think you've got to be slightly sick to be a, a <laughs> swimmer. Eh? Like, okay, you're triathlon, yeah, okay, we, we, we train a lot. Um, but we have three different sports. Like we can mix and mingle a bit. Uh, with swimming, it's like especially the you know some of the kids I I train with. Like I train with fifteen to eighteen year olds, but they all are so quick. Mm. Um, but you know they get up at five a.m. They swim until seven. Um, they have some brekkie. They go to school. And then they literally walk back into the pool for their second session, yeah. And they do that, you know, five, five, six times a week. It's um, a, hell 20, of a it's a massive commitment. So, like, yeah, I, I think any athlete, I'd have to give kudos to like the swimmers. They eh? like for me, I'm I'm tapped out at one session a day uh, mm. for five, you know, five times a week. Um, but yeah, it's like I think it's a lot better when you've, I guess, when you're young as well, because you you know you make those relationships with friends. Um, and it is quite nice to have, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot different, you know, you, okay, you don't, you hardly talk in a swim, um, session, but you're suffering with others. Yeah. Um, so it actually makes it go quicker where if you swim by yourself, it kind of does drag on a bit, mm. but yeah, you go with others, even though you don't talk to them, you know, they're doing the same session. Yeah. So you're kind of just suffering with each other, which kind of makes I, it go faster. And I suppose there's that sense of community as well, like yeah. outside of the pool, like beforehand and after mm. afterwards. A hundred percent. Yeah. I think if you grow up with those people in your life you know you've you've done it through you know most of your life yeah. so you kind of make those good relationships before you get in the pool after you get in the pool you have that banter with them so i think it is definitely like what drags kids you know they might not be the greatest swimmer in the world but they just kind of love the atmosphere mm. um which i kind of understand i can kind of see uh when i kind of rock up to the pool um, you know the kids are all the same age and they're all just having a good time and 
yeah, it's tough. It's a tough gig, but they really enjoy it. All right, can we get to the fun stuff now? Yeah, we'll take go, the seriousness out of yeah, it. And yeah, go yeah, for no, it. Go, we'll go to Tokyo. <laughs> right? Is it time yeah. to go to Tokyo? Let's go for it. Will I have my mask off? You can take it off if you want, on you. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh. You're right? Yep, good to go. Hayden Wild, <laughs> Olympic bronze medalist. How do those words sound? Oh, oh it's pretty awesome. <laughs> it's pretty awesome, eh? Like, far out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's pretty cool. Coming back in uh, 2019, um, and then coming back in 2021 and getting um, getting a podium. So, uh, yeah, no, pretty heavy, and uh, it's good to get a medal back in triathlon with uh, the men's. Um, a lot of inspiration from my coaches. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, that was definitely for my uh, yeah, that was for my family and uh, yeah, for my dad as well. He passed away like 12 years ago, so. He never got to see me race, so... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cheers for everyone back home as well. <laughs> so proud of you. <laughs> oh, man, I'll tell you what, I, I love that so much every time I see yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, I, I hardly even watch it, eh? But, um, yeah, no, it was a pretty awesome moment for the team, for sure. What do you mean for the team? Pretty awesome moment for you. You know, everyone thinks, I, I guess, back home, you know, like, thinks triathlon's such an individual sport, but... I've got such a massive team back home. Like, I just love coming home. Um, you know, like, I don't think I'd be the athlete that I am today with the people back home in Tauranga and Whakatane. Um, You know, Craig Kirkwood, you know, he's pretty much, you know, helped me from ground zero and same with Liz. So, um, you know, I've got such an awesome team. And, yeah, I know the effort comes from the athlete, but it's the kind of the magic that happens in the background. And, um yeah, like it was a pretty awesome moment, and as I said, you know, my no dad. Well, now it's past, you know, thirteen, mm. thirteen-ish years ago. So I never got to see me race. Um, so how old, were you, how old were, you, were you at the time? Yeah, so I was at I was at primary. Um, so I was about oh, what well, would be probably about ten years old. So you kind of knew what happened, but you kind of didn't know what did happen. Um, so my dad was a fertilizer pilot, and unfortunately had a bit of a mishap in the plane, and um, yeah, there was a kind of. Um, um, what do you call it, a, um, an engine failure. And um, unfortunately, just uh, the plane came down and that, was, uh, and that was that. So I was at a mate's house and mum told me had to come home and I thought it was a party. But, uh, you know, I for me personally, like I can talk about it, um, you know, it was, it was quite a while ago. So it's, it's for me, it's, you know, it's unfortunately one of those things that, that, that happened and it's terrible, but it, you've got to get on with life. And, you know, he's watching you and, um, and yeah, he's do, always... Do you feel that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, like actually the... The time that I did the half marathon, I got a, the tattoo on my back um, on that same day. So that was kind of uh, for him. So yeah, got this oh, tattoo. What's the, ta- what's the tattoo? Yeah, so I got the t- this tattoo on my back. Um, so it's pretty much a pilot compass, um, and then it's got some wings on it, um, and then the ropes for fishing, and then it's got north, south, east, west in it, and wherever I go, here we go with his initials and whatnot in it. So yeah, a lot of people kind of ask, "Oh, what's the tattoo about?" So that, yeah, that's what's mm. kind of what what it's about. So when you lose a parent at that age, is it one of those ones where like you look back now as a as a young man and think, shit, that was a that was a big thing. Can you sort of appreciate the magnitude of it oh, as a ten year old? Like I think as a ten year old, you kind of you you just you're just too young in a way. Mm. Uh, I think mostly my brothers would have felt it because I got two older brothers, uh, a couple years older than me. So obviously my oldest brother had to be the man of the house. So for him, it would have been a you know obviously a, a, probably a, a way different experience, um, you know, trying to be the man of the house and trying to look after us two uh, younger kids. So I guess I was more of a, a mummy's boy in a way. Um, so I didn't really, I definitely had a massive connection with my dad, but my middle brother was kind of the, uh, had was kind of daddy's boy in a way. So to have that, uh, I guess, a massive impact on, on my older two brothers, where, as I said, yeah, like as a, a real young kid, you didn't really understand the magnitude of what kind of just happened. Yeah. Bevan Doherty comes from a very sporting family, grew up in the Topo region with the lake and the mountains, a very strong multi-sport club meant the whole family became involved in the triathlon and the world champion, and what a day for him. Sure, he would have loved to have had the gold medal, but when he looks across the dais and sees his good mate Hamish there with the gold, uh, I don't think there's going to be much disappointment for Bevan Doherty. We'll always remember this day as the Carter Doherty Day in New Zealand sport. 
um, okay. yeah, yeah, I was very yeah, young, so I wouldn't even, I would, yeah, wouldn't even know what the sport was back right. then. So uh, it wasn't even sort of on your radar. There no, was, there wasn't a moment where you sort of went, no, know, I want to be like Hamish Carter. Yeah, so I only, you know, watched his race properly when I after Rio. You know, I was like. I was the Rio was kind of 2016 where I really kind of was like wow like that would be awesome to be um, to go to triathlon because at the point I was I was doing the off road stuff I was like oh, I'd be awesome to to go to the Olympics and and do um, do the on road stuff and I know it was going to be a huge uh, you know gamble so at the time I was I was actually working um, as a landscaper uh, I had an awesome crew around right? me though yeah had an awesome crew around me though yeah. like. Um, they did sp- a lot of sports themselves. So, you know, I would train in the morning, um, go to work uh, from like uh, nine till two, and then I'd do the rest of my training. So I, honestly, I don't know how I got through it. Um, just like the, uh, just all the training in the morning and then always on your feet and then going and doing some more training. I've did that for about three years just so I could fund myself. Cause I didn't go through like the, I guess the pyramid um, program as you would go through as a, as a normal kid through the high performance program. Yeah. So I kind of had to try and funnel myself in there and, and gain my own results. That was yeah, working part time as a landscaper, digging some holes and driving some <laughs> little diggers around and building some, some walls and uh, retaining walls and all that. And then finally got enough money for myself to, to head over to Japan. Uh, and I knew I was like, well, I need to race well uh, to get some points. If I don't get any points, uh, it kind of works as a system. You yeah. kind of do continental cups and then you go world cups and then you go to the, the big boy kind of world series where most of the Olympic athletes will kind of race. There's seven world series races in the world and you kind of follow them. That's our top, top end circuit. Um, and that's the way you want to be. Um, and then, yeah, after three years, finally got to that, that point in 2019 and obviously had that delay in 2020 and then came back in 2021 and had a blinder of a year. So. Yeah, is, is the money good? When you do a Google image search, there's a photo of you <laughs> holding a big ceremonial check. It's, it's um, 35,000 US. It's, triathlon's getting a lot better. Yeah. Um, obviously, if I, for example, if you look at running, it's very hard to make a living. Uh, yeah. With triathlon... Yeah. It's it's very uh, it's probably there's a lot more in it. Um, like I'm not making anything that would Roger Federer would make or anything uh, or a golfer. So if I was like if my world ranking was like I wasn't as a golfer, I'd be uh, having a mansion on the uh, on the North Shore or something like that. With you know triathlon, like you can make a good living. So um, you know this year I just made over six figures, which was wow. like a big a big year in triathlon for especially for short distance. Uh, you don't I don't have to come home and, and work as a landscaper anymore. That's what I have to say. <laughs> yeah. um, and do you think you'll ever um because I, I know uh, Lance Armstrong he, he um cut his teeth in triathlon and then I suppose realised yeah, he was he was a good runner but not a great runner, a good swimmer not a great swimmer mm. and obviously just you gravitated towards the bike. Uh, you, do you think you'll ever do that with running? I was actually thinking like I've always wanted to I was I've always wanted to one year maybe after, if, if it's maybe a year after Paris or after LA mm. I'm a little bit older uh, especially LA you'll be that 30 so you're kind of in that prime time to really switch over to the marathon yes. um, so I've always had ambitions of maybe trying out the road scene and trying to go a bit faster on the marathon or half marathon uh, Marathon. Uh, I've also kind of had uh, ambitions of maybe just being a pro cyclist and being like an ultimate domestique uh, I've always really kind of uh, enjoyed just having a team environment and sacrificing myself and for the team leader because yeah. a you don't have much pressure but you can just completely bury yourself for sixty k on the first part you know on the on a big stage race and and uh, and that's your job done for the day so um, yeah like I've yeah I've definitely had ambitions of of moving away from triathlon and giving something else a go um, which is obviously still in the sport but um, yeah just focusing rawly on that and, and seeing how it goes. That would be a pretty awesome kind of avenue to go yeah. towards. Oh, now that you've had a taste of success, I, I don't reckon you could be the bitch in a cycling <laughs> team. <laughs> I reckon you'd want to be the man, wouldn't you? Oh, you're you're not going to be going back to the support car and getting water bottles. Oh, I don't know. I think it'd be, I think it'd be pretty fun, eh? Like, you know, you don't have the big team pressure. As much as I thrive on pressure, uh, I think it'd just be fun kind yeah. of, tr- you know, going for someone. You know, you've, you've had the success as a, as a triathlete and you want to kind of, how you know try something else out it would be one of those things but yeah like marathon or even try and pushing the boat out and trying 10k uh, yeah. like a real quick 10k um, and really focusing on track stuff would be something I'd look into as well um, you know in Tokyo I did attempt to do the triathlon in the 5,000 meters I did mm. qualify through world ranking um, so 
there's two ways you can qualify uh, for the 5,000 metres in the Olympics. It's whether um, it just gets past the uh, Euro Olympic Committee. Right. Um, I was in the top 40 in the world, which you've got to be a first, uh, first-time first Olympian. You've got to be in the top 40 in the world for your uh, chosen distance in all sport and uh, athletics. And I was 38th uh, when you take up the Russians that did the uh, drug uh, doping. Uh, so that put that pushed me to the threshold nicely. So I actually qualified through, through placing, um, but unfortunately just didn't have the time. With the COVID uh, in New Zealand, we just didn't have enough athletes to push through a real fast 5K. We got close to it, so I was 10 seconds off, which, okay, in a 5,000 is quite a lot. Um, but um, just um, that's kind of working on the front as well, where, you know, if you've ever run, whether it's on the road or on the track, it's just you can switch off um, and just let others do the work just and then just sit them. in behind yeah. and just go for it. And yeah. that's what we kind of lacked get on the world stage and you get into these um, we you know athletics diamond leagues where the guys are running the Olympic qualifier um, you know just just like that um, that's the kind of sort of racing you want to get into so yeah we didn't have those opportunities and I unfortunately missed out doing the double but I'm going to give it a go on the com games as well um, it's uh, I think it's a, a 13 18 qualifier 13 17 so it's about five seconds slower 13 minutes 17 seconds yeah for 5,000 <sighs> Moving, so it's like 63, wow. 63 second per lap, uh, 400 laps. What's that per K? Like two, it's about two, 237, <sighs> about 237 per K. So I, I attempted to do it, it solo, sickening. very. So I got to three, I did it one one day, I, I went for it, and I went for it solo, which is very hard, uh, and I got to about 3.8 K, and I was on target, and then just all of a sudden you just hit the wall and just the whole the doors fell off and I think I went from being on on point uh, on time about 3.8k to then being about 30 seconds off it <laughs> well, there's another thing um uh, you had an attempt at the uh, the New Zealand record for one hour on a track yeah. as far as possible what's what is the current record stand at so Bill Bailey's got it and I think it was 20 point eight five or something like that it was it's definitely in the 20s and I think I ran 19.85 I think something like that so like a k off yeah so I was about a right. k off um or there or so I was it was it was between mm. eight it was between like four to a k 400 meters to a k so it was very <laughs> close hour though, isn't it? but Almost yeah hour. yeah so it was a tier like we had we had a three-day window um and it was in Auckland um and we just had, it was just three windy days. And the thing with the running track is, unfortunately, we got it on a day uh, at the track where it was the prevailing wind. Um, so with the prevailing wind at that track, you get a decent, you get about 100 metres of headwind, mm-hmm. uh, but then it's completely blocked at the back. So you get completely no wind, so you miss your tailwind. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you just come back and you get hit again. So um, unfortunately, with the track is... Um, you can't really gain that headwind back yeah. uh, from the tailwind, um, so yeah, it was it's always it was always going to be tough to do on that day. But my paces did well. I had Cam Graves who did well in the marathon. Sam Tanner, those good boys got me to about twelve k, and then just went solo for the last eight k and was on was on it until probably the last three k, uh, and then you kind of started really fatiguing, and that's when the um, the kind of yeah, I got to about fifty minutes, and oh man, I was suffering, eh? But I think if it was a better day, I probably could have got very close to it. Um, so yeah, I'll give it a go one one day yeah, again. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's just I think. Um, do you think that records attack? When did Bill Bailey do it? By the way, oh, very a uh, long like time 60s. ago. Six. I think yeah. it's the longest holding record in New Zealand, oh. um, just in front of um, you know some of the some of the greats um, in New Zealand. So. Yeah, one of the, I think yeah one I think it is the longest standing record in athletics history in New Zealand mm. at the moment. So it's a good you know sixty fifty years or something. Yeah. So I remember I think I talked to one of the old boys afterwards. He was like, yeah, uh, his post interview. He just said, oh yeah, I'll probably just go home and do my lawns and have a steak and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> just, just purely classic Kiwi. Yeah, it was quite How good. good. Mm. How good. Where's the medal? Where do you keep the um, the bronze? Yeah, so last, I guess the last three weeks I've just kind of been travelling around with it um, just because, you know, people like, oh, where is it, where is it? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, like it's it's uh, it's here with me. I think it's in the car, um, but I tell you, it's either here or it's at my mate's house, but I always try and keep it close to me. But nearly, I nearly got robbed uh, in Barcelona. Um, I uh, had, had an incident in Barcelona where a car got robbed and the bag that got, 
um, taken. My metal was always in that bag, but we, um, we were in an Airbnb, so I had the metal in the Airbnb. Mm. So I was very lucky that day. If something like that happened, if it got stolen or misplaced, could you? Can you write to the Olympic Committee and well, get a replacement? I don't. I, I don't think. I don't think you can get right. a replacement. That's the. That's. I think that's the most. Uh, a uh, scary thing is when you lose it, you lose it. Um, or when it gets stolen, it's, it's yeah, gone. You, it's gone. So you just hope that, you know, like, for example, when we, when we did get robbed, um, our part, the, the person that robbed us, um, they actually put our passports inside a bag and put it under a car. And this lady actually, i no, never seen her in my life, just reached out on Instagram in Barcelona and said, oh, I found your passports under my car. Uh, I've given it to the local police. Uh, so we got our passports Amazing. back, um, and then so you hope you know if they did see if there was Olympic medal in there with men's triathlon on it, they would hopefully re- you know put it under a car or return it yeah. to something. You know, <laughs> it'd be a shit thing to steal. What are you going to do with it? It means yeah, yeah. Like it has no real value, does it, to anyone? No, from you. exactly. Like I think I think a lot of people don't know what what uh, it's actually made out of. So it's coated in bronze, but the the foundation of it's actually uh, reused uh, or uh, recycled. Mm. Uh, Japanese metal yeah. um, made out of phones and all sorts. So the value of um, of um, I guess burning it down and um, making it bronze, it's it's <laughs> is you, you might get about fifty bucks out of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the Olympic experience was obviously amazing um, yeah. in terms of com- competition and winning the medal. But do you feel a bit shortchanged that you know that it was in a COVID year in terms of I, I feel like you you wouldn't have got the full usual Olympic experience where you get to mingle with other athletes. Yeah, and, like I guess I've never been. I guess I guess I can never really, um, until maybe hopefully Paris or any other event, I've never really can compare it to another yeah. Olympics. Um, but, we, you know, we still got to mix and mingle. Um, you know, the big kind of, the big cafeteria that everyone talks about where you go and have food and the big... Oh, the free food court. Yeah, the free food Maccas. court. No Maccas, because Maccas didn't sponsor it, so there's no Maccas. I was gutted. Oh, you did get ripped off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, right? But yeah, so like we went in there and you got to see some of the massive names of, of sporting, you know, like um, the, you know the US basketball team, so you got to see some pretty massive names there and, um, you know, just some of the massive names in New Zealand as well was were around, so just mixing, mingling with those mm. kind of athletes was really cool cool you know the top of their um you know the top of their crop of, of sport yeah. and i think the coolest thing was when um we were kind of getting a little detour and we were looking around and uh, before we actually got told we we're allowed to um go into the gym uh, a couple of the uh, nz guys took us to the gym just to have a look quickly and um you just saw like there was no uh, wannabes in there this gym mm. was just full yeah, of like the world clutch beast. athletes like there was guys just like chilling out doing like five minute handstands and just <laughs> doing massive like deadlifts and it was just insane like you, you you're pretty much looking at the best athletes in the world in one gym it was just like holy and then we saw uh one of uh china's like biggest um basketball players uh, i think it's kim yong i think uh, but he was like like he just made you look like you're a midget. Like mm. he was, you know, seven and a half foot. I think he's like 14 and a half, um, um, 14 and a half for his shoe size, wow. US. <sighs> and I'm just like, I'm in like an eight and a half, nine. Like that's nearly double my foot mm. size. Like I can't like comprehend that. <laughs> did, you, uh, did you fangirl over anyone in particular? Ask anyone for a photo? No, I didn't actually. I think because like the guys that I really wanted to see, they weren't in the village because um, there's a lot of athletes that don't come to the village not until really the end um, where the triathlon is one of the first events. So you kind of miss out a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the big players. So, right, right. Um, if, if I saw Kip Choge, I'd lose my shit. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was. I didn't see Kip because uh, the marathon was up uh, up the coast. It was meant to be cooler. Uh, but I did see a couple like Carapaz who won the road um, the road cycling. Yeah. I saw him and I was like, that's pretty cool. Uh, and he was like, he looks tiny and on the cameras, but he's like even mm. smaller in, in, in person. It must be quite good getting uh, getting your event out of the way early. Did you get to enjoy the Olympic experience after that or not so much? Well, it's of- it's quite funny because with the COVID uh, protocols, you've pretty much, once you do your race, you have 48 hours to leave. Uh, oh, and if no. you if you don't leave in the forty eight hours, you get put into the hotel until your flight leaves. Yeah. But we were quite lucky because we have two events. So um, we were there a week before, um, and then we did our race. But then we had five days of recovery before the mixed team relay. So then we had like a whole another four days of chilling in the village. So I think, and sports wise, we were probably the 
um, people that were in there for the longest. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we got we didn't get to go. We weren't allowed to go to like the athletics track and watch some of the events. I would have loved to go and watch the hundred meters or the fifteen hundred meter and watch my training partner um, Sam Tanner run pretty much the day I left is the day he arrived. I got to see him for that night, which was cool, but I had to leave pretty much as soon as he got there. So I was kind of like, oh, kind of, kind of gutting. Yeah. So I didn't oh, get next to time, know. next time, mate. exactly, exactly. <laughs> so aiming for Paris, and hopefully, yeah, COVID is. Uh, Restrictions have gone. Thing of the past. Oh, by then. dude. So, um, run through that race day. So, um, first of all, were you expected to get a medal? I think. Where, where do you think you should finish? Yeah. So, I think in twenty, if it was twenty twenty, uh, I would have been pretty chuffed with the top ten. I was tracking really well. I was running quick, um, but unfortunately, got stuck in New Zealand, and obviously everything else was cancelled. But it gave me a whole year to kind of yeah, nurture. True, true. Um, so. My swim was obviously my weakness. Um, it always has been, so it gave me another extra year of just, um, you know, learning my craft, um, ex, you know, getting some more knowledge um, and really kind of just dialing down on what my weaknesses were. Um, so, yeah, really focused hard on the swim and uh, try to, um, you know, expand my knowledge and kind of like uh, my stroke and my technique and all these sort of things. Um, and then... It gave a great opportunity for actually running as well because everyone was back from the States, from the NCAA, which is the pretty much like a university um, states college right. running. So we had all of our fast guys here. We, we had, I had that. And then, yeah, if, if I come in, coming into 2021, I was pretty – I know that if I had the race, I knew I could have, and in the stars aligned, I could have a pretty special day. Um, I was running the fastest I've ever run before. My swimming was the best it's ever been, and I kind of backed myself on the bike if anything kind of happened. Um, so, yeah, it was like it was just one of those things where I needed, I needed to get overseas and just have a few blowout races, um, as I hadn't raced in 20, 22 months or something like that. So I needed to get overseas. I needed to race. So I got three races in. So I raced my first race in May. What do you mean? What do you mean a blowout race? It's kind of okay. You, you're training. You're training well. You, you know you're hitting your targets. You're hitting better than you were yeah. uh, two years ago. But as good as training is, it's so different to to racing yeah. um, race speed and race and training fitness is just a completely different get ball game so I just needed to get overseas and race guys that I can toe to toe with the top 10 so you went to Leeds had a massive blowout pretty much if I race smart I could have probably got a podium in that race but the whole point was to go and burn out Russ so it was attack 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 defend and defend um, be silly on the bike and just go hard on the run and just see where you blow up and I was about I was second the whole race coming into the eighth eighth k and we had a group of five and then kind of my doors fell off because the guys in Europe have been have been racing yeah. through COVID so we, they've been you know been still racing for the last twelve months where I haven't you know touched a touched a start line in you know twenty months so to get that race was fantastic I went to Kitzbühel in Austria and raced the European champs so I got a wild card to to, to get a race in there. And, um, yeah, that's what kind of all I needed to know. Those two races uh, is what I needed to kind of know where my body was right. and where Craig kind of said, you know, like, hey, this is what we need to work on. Uh, you're pretty much there. You just need a couple of fine tunes and, a, and some certain areas. And when you come to Tokyo, you should be as good as you can possibly get. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, coming to Tokyo, I was – um, I guess confident in my own abilities, but there's so many things you can't control. Um, there's so many variables with the swim and the bike and the run. The only really one you can kind of control is kind of the run, um, but it's, it, you know, you could get a punch, you could be in a crash, um, you could get absolutely smashed by the guy next door to you uh, in the swim. So there's so many variables you can't control. So we kind of went in there and just said, just have some fun. You've got no... Um, you know, got you've got no pressure in a way. Uh, you're just going out there, just have enjoy it like it's any other race, and that's our mentality. We went in, just kind of race and just piss everyone off, really. That <laughs> it has that has kind of big expectations. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's what we did. We went out there, and um, people were saying, "Okay, yeah, Hayden might do well, but you know, he might do a top ten or a top seven or whatever. But you know, he shouldn't really be a podium contender." Um, but I knew my coach knew if we had a day that everything lined up 
that could be that could be pretty special and yeah, yeah it all lined up pretty nice. well and uh yeah ran, ran away into to a podium position so the, this where were you when you came out of the water so it's swim first and triathlon yeah so i think a lot of people that haven't watched me race before were freaking out like he's like oh he's so far behind like what's he doing and I was like, I was about 30, 40 seconds behind, which is actually a decent swim for me. I'm normally, say, if I look back at the Tokyo Test event in 2019, I was 90 seconds behind. Um, unfortunately, I had a bit of a mare in transition coming onto the bike. My helmet got knocked off and had to go and grab that and unfortunately missed the front pack. Um, so I had to, well, the chase pack, so the second pack. So got that and I just missed it. And then luckily there was a third pack with some amazing athletes in there. Uh, we all worked together and in three laps we caught the chase pack and then it all came together and kind of, we call it neutralizing. So the pack, uh, the, all the whole packs together and um, it kind of the, the intensity of the ride kind of lessens a bit and you can kind of, yeah, re you know, gather your uh, your energy and get ready for the run. Um, and that's how long was the bike ride? Forty k. Forty k. Yeah, forty yeah, k. So it was it's a, it was they kind of it was a very technical course. So a lot of U turns, ninety degree turns, uh, very tight. So you had to, in a way, even though it did neutralize a bit and did get a little bit easier, uh, you had to be in a good position or else you, you would suffer big time. So I was normally sitting around that top five, uh, staying out of trouble for one and just always kind of watching um, kind of where the attacks will be and, um, yeah, just sat there nicely and then waited for the run and knew that I had to had to go to the front straight away, sit in the top three. And I think I it was the best time because when, when you talk – when when runners talk about going into the flow state and just running feels easy, and I think we're running about 255s, 250s, and I just felt, like, amazing. Like, it just did not feel, like, it just felt effortless in a way. Wow. Um, and then when we got to that last 2K where Christian did his attack, I, I've been studying Christian and Alex. I knew Alex was very aggressive around corners, so what Alex would do, he would come out of a corner and he would hit it pretty hard to try and drop us. And then Christian, I knew, would sit on until the end, and then he would kick down the last 1,500 metres. He did that three times in the, in the last three races. So I knew he was probably going to do that, and that's what he did. And I think we were just too stuck in the metronome state, but also mentally Alex and I, so Alex and I are really good mates and uh, you know, first-time Olympians. So I think we kind of came into the race, and that last lap we were like, oh, you know, we kind of, I think in a way we, in a way, okay, we may have been able to hold on to Christian for a little bit longer, but I think we kind of settled as like, oh my God, we're just about to get Olympic medals. Uh, Where Christian, that's his third time uh, going for it. Um, So he's had that experience and he really obviously wanted that gold medal. As much as I wanted the gold medal as well, you kind of mentally, you kind of just go like, you kind of just settle for what you got. Um, And, you know, like it was, oh, you know, last lap we had 45 seconds um, in front of like, the fourth, like no matter what. So the medal was in the bag. Exactly, exactly. So the only thing that could happen is you could like just pull a muscle. That's the only thing that could happen, but it was too hot for that kind of in a way. So um, yeah, we kind of got into that last 1500 metres and we, I think we did settle for a podium, but we, yeah, it was just, I think it was just that young mentality of like, oh, we're going to get a medal, but we just didn't know what won. <laughs> so oh, that is amazing. Yeah, yeah. So it was pretty cool. In hindsight, like, could you have done more, do you think? Or I think. If I look back at it, um, I did spend a lot of energy. I think I've panicked a little bit coming out of the water where the where I had the fumble of the helmet, um, and I was pushing well above what I should have been pushing on the bike because I didn't actually realize there was a, a good group behind me. So I probably spent five percent of the energy that I probably shouldn't have that I didn't need to yeah, use. Yeah. What ifs? Exactly. Hey, what all ifs? the if, all the ifs. So, but you got yeah. I. I, I yeah, if I look at where I've come from and where I kind of placed, like I don't think I could, you know, write that in a book, you know. Yeah. So. Oh, mate, it's a, an incredible performance, and that um that speech um that we played before, just mm. on the finish line, I get goosebumps every time I hear it. Yeah. It's just amazing. I think I've, yeah, it's like I don't really listen to it too much because I'm like, oh man, man needs a <laughs> Grammy for that, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's 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 real, it's raw, yeah. it's vulnerable, it's powerful. Yeah. It's just, I mean, you're obviously just completely spent at that point and just elated as well. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was a pretty awesome, like, it's a massive moment and, you know, it's like the pinnacle of our sport. It's just like, 
having something like that and, you know, Bevan Doherty and Hamish Carter, yes. you know, they've got yeah. three of them and it, the first one was in Sydney in 2000 uh, where it all started off. So, you know, there's only a, a handful of guys that actually have Olympic medals. So it's like, it's a pretty prestige um, kind of group of people. So oh, it really it's is. amazing to be a part of it. it really is. Yeah, and, and this is you for life, regardless yeah. of what happens from here on in. Yeah. Even yeah. wild Olympic medalist. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's pretty awesome. Like you kind of, especially when you rock up to races now on the on the world circuit, you get introduced going onto the, the blue carpet, we call it, on the, mm-hmm. onto the yep. pontoon, and they say like Olympic medalist, like Hayden Wild, and it's like, wow, it's pretty cool. <laughs> so good, mate. So uh, good. Yeah. Wow, what a story. Yeah. What a story. Uh, the Maltese Falcon, is that still your nickname? Yeah, it is. What, what it does is. that mean exactly? Yeah, we've got it in Malta, and uh, it's in the Mediterranean, a Malta little island just off Italy, off the boot. And uh, I was climbing up this hill, uh, and uh, I was like, the way the way that I race, as you've probably heard, is I come out of the water a little bit behind. I um, come through the rankings on the bike, and then have a pretty solid run. It's not a strategy, by the way. You just no. Swim it's, up. Ju- it's just it's just it just is what it is. <laughs> and um, and then and then over the mic, this guy was like, "Oh, here comes the Maltese Falcon." I have no clue who he's talking about. Uh, and then we finish up, and then they really wanted to get the Maltese kind of um, fan base up, so they started calling me the Maltese Falcon. So I asked him, I was like, "I was like, am I the Maltese Falcon?" They're like, yeah, mate, we just started calling you that, and I'm like, and it's stuck ever since. And the reason why they've called me that is there used to be this guy who's war was kind of like a war hero around there, and the way he used to attack his enemies was he used to lay low under the GPSs on the and his and his jet fighter. He used to come around the island and then attack them from behind, and that's what kind of my tactic is: is come out of the swim a little bit behind, attack them on the bike, and then uh, and then catch them on the run. So it's like, oh, here comes the Maltese Falcon. It's just kind of stuck ever since. So that's how the nickname kind of turned up in a way. So it's a great nickname. Yeah, yeah. I say it could be worse. So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, hey, hey, that's great. And you're, by the way, we didn't point out you're in Auckland at the moment to show moral support for your girlfriend who's in MIQ. Yeah. I've, um, which seems nuts to me because it's like there's, I've been in MIQ, you've been in MIQ, yeah. you, you can't see her. Yeah, it's... What, it's, what, are, you, what are you doing? Is it just, um, you're waving at her from the street? Or? Yeah, well, we had a lunch date yesterday. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I took her sushi. Uh, so she's on like the eighth floor. And uh, I, I rocked in, gave uh, gave the person the sushi and said, oh, this is for this person's room. Yeah. And then I just park out on the side of the road. I turned FaceTime on, so and then I just turned it on speaker. And then we just talked through the phone, and then I can just see her in this window. And that, that's how we have our lunch dates. Um, God, that's sweet. Yeah, so I was like, and also I kind of came out to Auckland for a bit of admin as well. Mm. I had some things to do here and there. So it actually worked out quite well, as yes, I knew. She was coming to Auckland, and then I was like, well, I've got to do some things, so I might as well yeah. come up for the 10 days, and if she needed anything, I could just go in straight away, and you know, if she drop needed need some snacks, so I can drop it off so she didn't have to worry about anything. So, yeah, yeah it worked out pretty well, yeah, and uh, nice. she's out on Monday, so I know kind of... It's her second time in there. I know how it feels, and it just sucks. So, oh, it if, drags. If, I can, if I can help anyway, you know, I'm not too far away. So, yeah. 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 How, how long have you guys been seeing each other? Uh, two and a half years now. Yeah. Uh, met on the circuit. So, uh, oh, she's she a triathlete as well. Yeah, she's, she's Belgium. Uh, so, she's uh, second ranked in Belgium at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully, a, a Paris contender. So, she'll be heading over there. But our wish she was is uh, trying to keep her at a hospital. She loves to crash. Uh, so we yeah we crashed in 2019 together. This kid ran on the road and we went over the handlebars and she knocked herself out and I somehow ninja rolled out of it and just got a hematoma on the ankle and that was it. But she was knocked out on the ground for about 90 oh. minutes and it's crazy how head injuries um, just hit you out. Like she was probably suffering for nearly every year over a year and uh, just got into it and uh, uh, just as we finished off season in Girona in Spain. Uh, if, uh, if anyone likes Game of Thrones, that's where the big castle is in Girona. A lot of cyclists go there. It's an amazing place. And uh, we did one of the famous climbs up Rocky. Well, she did one of the famous climbs up Rocky Corber. And I get this call, Hayden, I've crashed. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> and, she's, and she's like, it's pretty bad. I'm like, oh, man, what have you done? She's like, um, I can see my bone. I'm like, oh. oh. So she did a double fracture in the finger. Um, and yeah, had to get operation and stuff, and the operation went well, we thought, and yeah, um, didn't go actually well. They thought they did a good job, but they kind of messed up, and one of the plates was actually restricting her movement in one of her fingers, so she couldn't actually properly 
move her move her finger, and then she's yeah um, now yeah, four months down the track and only st- still doing rehab. So wow, out, still battling through that, just like a toe or a finger. They're an absolute pain in the ass to fix. So yeah. Amazing how um, such a small part of um, the body can cause you so much grief. Yeah, so she can't really grip onto the bike too much, so a lot of indoor training, and she's getting back into the pool. But, yeah, she's a natural swimmer, so uh, she comes from a swimming background, so that's her strength. So, it's um, yeah, she's kind of kicks my ass in the pool every so often. Mm. She uh, takes a couple there, but, um, yeah, she'll get back to hopefully normal and, uh, yeah, smash the circuit. And, yeah, we pretty much follow the same sort of racing, so it yeah. works out pretty well. God, it'd be nice to see her again. Yeah, it's been a couple months. We went yeah. to we went to Mount. We oh, last time I saw it was in December, so it hasn't been too bad. Through COVID, was about seven months, so it's quite nice to yeah. When I'm overseas, we come together and we're literally pretty much doing everything together. So it's quite nice and kind of when you for, uh, when you go away, it's uh, it's it's pretty crazy, you know, having that person there mm. all the time, and then just straight away it just goes. It's like ah, oh, I'm kind of my life is actually quite boring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so it'll be nice to get her out on Monday, and uh, yeah, we're here until until May, and then we head over to Yokohama for the first uh, for the first race. Yeah, brilliant, so, exciting. Hey, yeah. um, I look forward to see. What's in your future um, yeah. with Commonwealth Games, Olympics, and just whatever you do next? Because I'm sure whatever you do, you <laughs> excel and do it amazingly well. Yeah, give it a good crack, and no, just loving it, being home, and uh, just embracing the the yeah, I guess the success of uh, of what happened, and yeah, had that had like five months of delay of not getting it, being able to celebrate the medal. So it's nice to just come here and just celebrate and have a good time. So yeah, how yeah. good, how good, yeah. Hayden Wild, Olympic medalist. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been good. Thank you so much for sitting down with me today. No, it's been a pleasure. We've, uh, it's good that we finally got it uh, got it done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I really, I really appreciate it. It's so good of you to do that. Yeah, thanks, man. No dramas. Oh, you're still here, aren't you the best? Um, thank you so much for listening all the way through. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I'm guessing a lot of people don't make it this far, so so if you have done, uh, yay, yay for you. I really appreciate it. No pressure, but do me a favour if you want. If you don't already do this, uh, like, subscribe, follow, do whatever you've got to do, wherever you get your podcast from. I'm not sure how it makes a difference, but apparently it does. Feel free to give it a rating, like a five star or a review. And um, I think the best sort of marketing I can do to spread the word about this podcast and this mission we're on is um, the word of mouth stuff. So let a friend know if you think they'll enjoy it or share it on your social media channels. But no pressure to do any of that, only if you want. Uh, The main thing is I just appreciate you being here, appreciate you listening to this, and I really hope you got something out of it. Feel free to send me any feedback, complaints, criticisms, whatever you've got, any time. I won't necessarily change anything, but I do read it all, and I do take it all on board. Instagram's a good way to get a hold of me. Slide into my DMs at domharveynz, or email me, domharveynz at gmail.com. Okay, thanks so much. I hope to see you next week.